Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Canola Producers Commission, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Growers. I'm Lindsay Smith with realagriculture.com. I'm joined today by Jan Dyer. She's the Director of Government Relations with the Canadian Canola Growers. Welcome here, Jan. Thank you. All right, so Jan, um, lots of discussion. Of course, Parliament is now back in session, which we've got all sorts of laws and lovely bills coming forward. Take me through how a bill comes to be and how then that bill mil moves through the process and becomes law. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would say that most legislation, uh, the bulk of the work goes on ahead of time. Before you see the bill in Parliament, there is usually extensive study, lots of analysis, lots of consultations, either written uh, by in person, town hall meetings, uh, formal submissions, there's a vast array of mechanisms that can be used in formulating a piece of legislation. For example, uh, C-18 that's currently before Parliament, the Agricultural Growth Act, is actually a larger bill that combines a number of amendments to various pieces of legislation that require updating. So the government's taken the opportunity to take all the input from the consultations that they've had on the various pieces of legislation that need to be updated and put it in one bill for consideration and that in turn will update a number of other pieces of legislation. It's, a, it's an efficient way to do a number of things at once when some of the subjects are related. So now that's sort of what, <clears throat> what goes into a bill coming forward but of course, once a bill is presented, there's then a, a process to which groups like yourselves and other um, interested parties and industry can then still discuss what's going into that bill. So walk me through sort of once a bill has been presented, what's the process? Well, the process is formalized in terms of how Parliament deals with it. Once a bill is formulated, after the consultations have been done, and I should say that farm organizations often have a big part in what goes into a bill at the beginning. Um, they regularly speak to legislators and decision makers about what changes are required. There is often review of uh, standing acts that uh, are required by legislation. A number of acts, for example, that have regulatory mechanisms have built-in mechanisms that say they need to be reviewed every, say, five or ten years. Um, so those kinds of things go into the formulation of the bill. When it's first introduced into Parliament, it is read into the, into the record of Parliament in what's called first reading. That is, uh, it's presented, it's introduced, and then time is allotted in Parliament for discussion and debate. Uh, the bill will come back at, at second reading for a more fulsome debate. So at second reading, that's where you um, see, wh if you watch CPAC or you stand up and watch the uh, House of Parliament at any, at any point, you will see debates being um, discussed. The Bill C-18, for example, was discussed over a number of days last spring and just before uh, June when Parliament recessed. That's the opportunity for the government to, pre to answer questions, for the opposition members, for other parties to have a say about what's in the bill. So they will have looked at it, they will have their own views because they will have spoken to individuals, they will have done their own analysis, they will have been talking to farm groups or trade associations or other people interested in what's going forward and they will have views and they will bring those views forward in Parliament. So that's what's called uh, second reading. So they read it in for the second time and then they have debate. That debate can go on for a long period of time. Uh, the government is allowed sometimes to invoke what they call closure, which is to limit the amount of time that a bill can be discussed. And they do that sometimes uh, when they're trying to move legislation through very quickly. For example, Bill C-30, the transportation bill, was uh, done in a short time because the situation was urgent. 
So after the bill gets debated in second reading, th then it's passed to the committee, appropriate the appropriate committee for the bill in question. So for most agriculture issues, it goes to the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food, where the committee convenes to discuss the bill and they call witnesses. So a number of witnesses can be called. Um, as an individual, you can actually ask to be um, a witness for the bill if you have something to say. Uh, I don't think it's commonly understood that committee meetings are open to the public. People can go and observe, people can request to appear, and on C30, for example, the transportation bill, we did have a couple of people who uh, appeared as individuals. Sometimes they are academics. Academics often appear as individuals, but there was another, there was in one, this case one farmer who decided to uh, appear as an individual and that, that testimony was heard and considered. Those committee meetings can go on for some time. Uh, calling all interested parties who wish to participate in the discussion. Once those testimony have been heard and all members of the standing committee, so it's an all-party committee, have had an opportunity to hear the testimony, the committee then deliberates on what they've heard. They can then introduce amendments. The final piece of the committee meetings is what they call a clause by clause consideration. When they take the bill, they read each clause individually, they vote on whether that clause can pass, and at that time, anyone on the committee can introduce amendments. Of course, they don't have to be accepted. If you have a majority government and you don't wish to accept the amendment, of course you have that right. This is where the role of the Parliamentary Secretary for Agriculture, for example, would have a large role. If the government decides that they've heard enough evidence that they should make some amendments, they will, in fact, have that introduced through the Parliamentary Secretary. And in fact, on Bill C-18, the Parliamentary Secretary has promised that there will be an amendment clarifying some of the language on farmer saved seed. So we already know that that amendment will be introduced. Once the bill has passed the clause by clause, it is reported back to Parliament for third reading. And it will be reported back with the amendments if they're accepted by the committee. It's read a third time, it's passed, and then it goes to the Senate. And the same process happens again. The Senate considers the bill, reads it first and second time considers the bill in Senate committee meetings. In, this, in the case of agriculture, it's the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Forestry. They also call witnesses, often the same witnesses, hear the same testimony. The Senate can also make amendments at that time. There's one other mechanism that we saw a lot in C-18 that I think is worthy of mention, and that is that individuals can petition to have their views considered on a bill. We saw lots of uh, petitions on C-18. They, various members of the public petitioned their MPs to stand up in the House and raise the issues that they were concerned about. In, in, in C-18, a lot of that was surrounding UPOV 91 and the right to save seed. So that's all input that the government hears when they're debating the bill that can lead them to change their mind about how they present the bill, make amendments, make adjustments. So once it's through the Senate, uh, again after hearing all the testimony and passing clause by clause, then it goes for royal assent and finally comes into force. Bill doesn't necessarily have to come into force immediately after assent, it can come into force um, a number of days later or a period of time later, so not necessarily as soon as it, it receives royal assent does it come into force. After that, then there's the regulatory process, which is again an opportunity for public input on how the bill gets implemented. A good deal of how things happen actually happen in the regulatory process. So once it moves on to regulations, then again, you have another formal period of comment 
going through what we call the Canada Gazette 1 and 2 uh, process whereby the government formally asks for submissions from the public on the implementation of the bill. Again, that's where farm associations have a big role to play because farm associations follow all of those processes. They will do, make submissions on behalf of their members, addressing the implementation, addressing their concerns, continuing to push for the things that they've heard from their members. They can have heard from their members through open dialogue, they can have heard through, from, from their members through um, open annual general meetings where you know issues are raised on the floor. Uh, there's a number of various mechanisms that farm organizations use to gather that information. So there can be lots of input, there can be lots of opportunity for dialogue, discussion, for changes, and so the process is, is, is fairly lengthy, but again it's a democratic process whereby people do get to have a say about the legislation, the regulations that follow, and how the policies get adopted. So now it is um, certainly a lengthy process, but there's, as you've sort of painted the picture, there's several ways and means that farm organizations or even individuals can stand up and say what they would like to see or would like to see changed or why a certain clause might be important to them or, or the other way. How then would you encourage farmers to be involved and connected to this process? Because, I mean, obviously we've got staff in Ottawa that are working on these um, bills all the time and representing farmers. Um, obviously we have farmers that fly in and, and present as part of their grower groups and, and those sorts of organizations. As an individual, how could you encourage a farmer to be connected to this process? Well, in the case of our organization, we hear directly from farmers all the time. They email us, they call us, uh, the Canadian canola growers has the advantage a little bit in that we hear from growers on a daily basis when we administer the programs for them. So <clears throat> farmers often take that opportunity when they're applying for their cash advances to tell us about other things that, that concern them. We take note of that, um, we listen to their concerns, we have dialogue back and forth with them as individuals, but primarily the way that that in input comes to us is through our board of directors. Our board of directors are all farmers. They are all elected in their, their respective regions within the provinces that we um, have members in, so Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. Primarily, they gather information from their local regional associations. Alberta, for example, has a series of regional meetings every spring where they discuss issues with their growers. Those go to the Alberta Canola Associations. Then the Alberta Canola Association representatives on the CCGA bring those issues to us. So that's where we make the decision about what to follow and we give the information back out to them. For example, on transportation this year we are actually going out to help with some of the discussions about how the Bill C-30 has been um, has gone through what the implications are for for growers, what the regulations imply for transportation, etc. So it's a two-way dialogue where we hear directly from farmers, we tell them what we think is going on in Ottawa and other places, and so that's how the information gets exchanged. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jen.